Good evening, fellow saints, brothers and sisters in Christ, friends and family. I want to welcome you to our evening Bible study. Uh, of course, we are in the Beatitudes of Jesus Christ, and so uh, we will be studying that from Matthew chapter 5, verses, uh, right now we're in verses 4. Uh, and so we're going to look at the Beatitudes and what it means for the Christian or the disciple of Jesus Christ following Jesus. What should he look like? What should his attitude and his mindset should be as you follow Jesus and as you implement these staircases of uh, Christian ethics or beliefs to your faith? What should you begin to look like? What should this person have? And so we're going to look at that um, beginning with our right now in our study, uh, Blessed Are They Who Mourn. But before we get going, I want you to notice uh, those who are on our prayer list, please keep Sister Callan Bush in your prayers. She's asking for safe travels um, as she goes to the graduation, her grandson's graduation. So we want you to keep her in your prayers and uh, may God bless her and, sit and keep her safe in terms of health wise and all those around. Our, one of our, our fairly new converts, Farrell Hall, is asking for prayer for the loss of his father and for um, his own health and well-being. So pray for Farrell uh, and his family. Pray for him and his strength and his mindset that God will uh, keep him and uh, keep his mind and health uh, secure. Sister Mildred Miles, we want you to also keep her in your prayers concerning her health. And the many others who are on our continued prayer list, we want you to keep be mindful uh, of all of those who have been asking for continued prayer uh, in their time of need. Now, we've been studying uh, this beatitude, the, the blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we've noticed that while Jesus is not necessarily talking about uh, mourning concerning the loss of uh, uh, health or loved one or physical uh, material things, uh, Jesus is fundamentally dealing with the mourning of, of those because of sin. Those who have a clear understanding of sin. And so Jesus is dealing with that. And I want you to note something uh, because it's something that we don't often talk about when, when it comes to sin and when it comes to mourning and, um, in this particular setting. We often talk about sin being uh, one that of missing the mark with God. Uh, we talk about sin being uh, uh, committing unrighteousness and breaking the, violating the laws of God. Um, but we rarely talk about what sin does to God. And those are things we got to keep, we have to keep in mind when it comes to sin, when it comes to how uh, God views sin. And one of the greatest deceptions and tricks that the devil puts on man and even Christians is to make us think that sin, as long as it doesn't affect someone else talk from human relationships, that uh, it's okay. Or that uh, what I do is only relative to me in my own personal life. Therefore, um, I could, it, sin has no real bearing on how I live or how I think. And what he does is he gets us to remove God out of the equation and he gets us to believe that because it hadn't brought harm to anyone else or because it doesn't affect necessarily other people that we lose sight that it affects God in terms of how God feels about it. And what Jesus is saying is, blessed are they who mourn, because the reality is they understand what sin does to God, how it makes God feel. And I think we often miss that and we fail to talk about that. But I want you to look at a passage of scripture in Genesis chapter 6. 
And in Genesis chapter 6, I want you to notice, we're going to begin at verse number 1. In Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, Now it came about, and when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives to themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they brought children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the, now watch this, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of thought of his heart was evil continually. The Lord was sorry. Now another translation says the Lord uh, repented, but God doesn't repent for sin or some wrongdoing the way man is. This simply meant God was sorrow, sorrowful. He was hurt by what he saw in his creation. Here he puts man on the, in the garden to till the garden, to keep it, to live a blissful and beautiful life and have a, life, a lasting relationship with him. And they allow Satan to contaminate it. Sin wreaks havoc through Cain and Abel, down on through to Noah, all down to now uh, men who God has created, they have now contaminated their relationship with God by way of wickedness. The Bible says God saw that man had become wicked continuously. Now, notice he says, and the Lord was sorrow, sorry that he had made man on the earth. He was grieved. Here's what it means. He was grieved in his heart. Look at what sin did to God. Notice how sin made God feel. Now, I, I brought you to that scripture simply, and we won't, there's so much in there, but we don't need to really go so far in depth. I just wanted to bring that to your attention of how sin makes God feel. Now, I want you to understand, if you can grasp just that little bit, if you can apply that to your own life and, uh, and you begin to think about, perhaps from your past, even to right now, and you think about where you were, where you used to be, up to where you are now, what got you to that point today? When you recognize it, that at some point in my life, sin not only severed my relationship with God, but sin grieved the heart of God that it, it affected you so much so that you gave your life to the Lord. Now, if you can keep that in mind, that's going to keep you on the straight and narrow. Now, I'm not saying legalism. I'm not talking about um, trying to walk in a way that you are perfect and you are above everyone else. No. What I'm saying is keeping in mind that sin grieves the heart of God helps us to keep things in the proper perspective. Well, you know that what I do grieves the heart of God it compels you to not go back down that road again. When you realize that the things that I've been saying out, out verbally about someone or toward someone, using words that God would forbid, when you recognize that it grieves the heart of God, you're, re you're reluctant to move down that path of sin again. And I want us as Christians, as people in the body of Christ to recognize that, the listen, the, the shout of our day isn't always that God's going to bless us and with some, some, a job or a house or a car with some money. God, though, re, the real blessing for me is to know that I recognize that my sin grieved the heart of God and it compelled me to give my life to Jesus. 
That's your shout. That's what gives you joy. That's what gives you a comfort of heart of knowing that because I mourn, I mourn because I recognize what sin did to God. And I recognize that my sin is what caused Jesus to go to the cross. I can remember, I, I, it, it reminds us when Jesus says, you will be comforted. It gives you peace to know that my sin grieved God. It caused us to be enemies. But because of Christ, my middleman, my, ad, my, my advocate, Bringing us together, it now gives me peace. Notice what Isaiah would say. Let's come to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, if you will. Now, in Isaiah chapter 61, what Jesus is going, or uh, what God is going to do uh, through Isaiah is he's going to have Isaiah preach good news to the people of God. They are in captivity because of sin. Uh, they are now broken. They, have, uh, they, they are living life hopelessly right now. They don't see an end to uh, their captivity. They are discouraged. They are weakened in faith, if you will. And God is going to send Isaiah to preach to them, but he isn't going to send Isaiah alone by himself to preach to God. Notice, he's going to send Isaiah a helper. Now that brings us to the next point, and that is the description of blessedness. This description of blessedness, when he says, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That comes from two Greek words. One is para, and the other is kaleid. Para alongside, kaled, to call, to call along one side. It also means uh, para kaleo, the verb form, it means to comfort one, to encourage, to bestow spiritual aid upon another. Now, watch what Isaiah says to God's people in Isaiah chapter 61. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now notice the first, from the outset, God says, I want you to go to my people and preach good news to them. But how is he going to preach good news to a people who right now only see bad news, to a people who only see uh, hopelessness, to a people who only see disparity and discouragement. He says, I'm going to give you a helper, a comforter, a one who will render spiritual aid. It's the Spirit of the Lord. That is the Holy Spirit. And so Isaiah is going to preach good news to the brokenhearted. And let me tell you, church, that's what this world desperately needs right now. Good news. When you look on the news, uh, to even today, all you see is negativity. All you see is sinfulness and wickedness and revenge and all manner of evil. But the world, by, by being saturated with such devilment, we need, as the people of God, as preachers of God, we need to make sure we are giving people the good news of God. Good news not only to his people, but good news to the world. To bring, to bind up, to loose those who have been bound. To set the captives free. To preach to those who are brokenhearted, those who are in prison to Satan. He says preach, and guess what? And God has given us a comforter to do such. One, to give, render spiritual aid in doing it. Well, look at John chapter 14. Look at John chapter 14. And John chapter 14, 
and verse number 11. Notice what Jesus says to his disciples. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, keep uh, me, you will keep my commandments. How are they going to do all of this? How are they going to accomplish great things for God and glorify God in the, in, and his Son? How are they going to keep his commandments knowing that they are they are uh, uh, fragile and, and sinful at best. How are they going to do such? Watch verse 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. He will give you another comforter. He will give you one who will render spiritual aid. That's the Holy Spirit. He may be with you <clears throat> forever. Look at John chapter 15. In John chapter 15 and verse number 26, notice what Jesus says again. When the helper, when the helper, the parakaleo, when the helper comes, when he who will render spiritual aid comes, the comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. <clears throat> He's going to send a helper. He's going to send a comforter. But notice, come to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Familiar, another familiar passage of scripture. 1 John chapter 2, and you remember what John would say. To the saints there, the little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not, but if you sin, you have an advocate, you have a helper, you have one who will render spiritual aid. He is, now we've been looking at the Holy Spirit, well now, here in this text, John says it's Jesus who will be your paraclete. It's Jesus who will render spiritual aid. Jesus who will be your comforter. It is Jesus who gives you what you need, your, and he will be your encourager. He says it's Jesus, the righteous, and he is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for those of the entire world. Oh, how comforting it is to know we've got aid, we've got a spiritual helper. And then you've got all, you've got not only the Holy Spirit as a helper, you have Jesus as your helper. And ultimately, you've got God as your helper. He says, blessed are they who mourn. And you mourn because of what sin does, and it causes you to recognize, boy, at one point in my life, I didn't have such help. At one point in my life, I was destitute from having spiritual aid rendered me. I was void of God in this world without Christ, without hope, without the ability to, uh, to make it successfully, spiritually speaking. And when you know that, it causes you to mourn. But it also causes you to be humble and it causes you to be appreciative of what God really accomplished at the, at the cross for you and I. So he renders aid, he calls him to our side, but then let's, let's look at a few ways uh, these mourners are comforted. Let's look at a few ways. One way that the mourners, those who mourn, will be comforted is that we have peace in salvation. Notice Psalms chapter 32, and it's a beautiful passage that David writes. Psalms chapter 32. Notice from the outset, notice how David explains how mourners are comforted. In Psalms chapter 32, verse 1, David says, How blessed is he 
whose transgression is forgiven. I told you this morning that it had, that has nothing to do necessarily with the loss of physical uh, blessings, has nothing to do with the loss of health, has nothing, nothing to do with the loss of a car, or job, or whatever. This morning that one goes through is their recognizing of sin. And David says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Church, I want you to let that sink into your spirit. How blessed, David said, is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Put that in perspective. How the world wants you and people you may know want you to believe that I am blessed by my social status, my material status, or well-being. David says, the person whose sins are forgiven, he says, that's the real person. That's the person who's really blessed. The person who God does not impute sin to, the one who God does not keep record of their account, that's the one who is really blessed. Now notice what else David said. He says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. <laughs> oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. One old preacher said, said it this way. He's thankful that God blesses us blindly. Not that God cannot see, but that God blesses us without seeing reasons why he should. <laughs> oh, church, let that sink in. God blesses us blindly, not that he, can, he cannot see, but God blesses us in such a way as to not taking into account reasons why he should. And so it, in a human way to express it, it would be like God sending you blessings while covering his eyes. So that he'd, uh, he'd, have, he'd have no reason. But here's the caveat. He has reason why he shouldn't bless us. Yet God still blesses us. And David, like Jesus says, the blessed man is him whose transgressions have been forgiven and whose sins are covered. Oh, church, what a blessing. That gives me, ble that gives me joy and reason to stick with God no matter what comes my way physically speaking. And you've got to have the same attitude and disposition toward God. That listen God, take, things may be taken away from me. This COVID pandemic may, may have the world in a frenzy and I may, or I may lose my job or may have already lost my job. But one thing I know, I am still blessed because I am forgiven. What David is really saying to, to me is that we need to make sure we are looking at blessings in the proper context and the proper perspective. Yeah, you may have everything that the world has to offer, but if you don't have forgiveness of sins, if your transgressions aren't forgiven and your sins are not covered, I'm afraid to have to tell you, you aren't really blessed. That's why you can't be tricked by the devil in thinking, I need to grab all, I need to live my best life. Nothing wrong with having nice things, not wrong, nothing wrong with even living your best life. But make sure you have it in perspective that the reality is, I need to make sure my sins are forgiven. Notice what else David says. David says, he says, how blessed is the man to whom, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. In other words, David says, I am blessed. How blessed is the man who God does not write down on his, his spiritual ledger or an account book, my iniquity. And who better to talk about being forgiven and shown the grace and mercy of God than David. Do you remember what David did in uh, taking Bathsheba, who was another man's wife, and then having uh, her husband killed? 
in the process to try to cover up. But watch this. He tried to cover up his sins. He tried to cover up his nakedness spiritually. But only God can cover our nakedness spiritually. David tried to do it himself by having, you, having her husband killed. He tried to cover it up. No, you can't cover up sins by human hands. The only one that can cover our sins and transgressions is Almighty God. Look at what happened with Adam and Eve. Didn't Adam and Eve, after they disobeyed God and they listened to Satan, they tried to hide themselves with feebly heat. Uh, they tried to hide themselves from God. But you can't hide yourself. You can't hide sin with human hands. Only God can cover you. And David says, how blessed is the man who God does not write down on his account his iniquity. But then he says, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. He says, wow, when I kept silent about my sin. Now watch this. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. He said it was more detrimental to try to hold in and not acknowledge and confess my sin to God. He said it was more detrimental to do that, to try to keep my sin hidden, than to come clean with God. He says his body wasted away and through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy. Look at, I'm trying to tell you, when you understand how sin grieves God, you're not, you're not as prone to go down a certain path of sin, or you are humble enough always to confess to God and to repent of your sins. He says God's hand was heavy on him because he was unwilling to repent. But then notice now, he says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever uh, of, with the, with the fervor heat of summer. But now notice what David did to relieve himself. Verse 5 says, I acknowledged my sin to you, my iniquity, and I did not hide it. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Listen, that's why David could say the man who is blessed is the man whose sins, transgressions have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. You know why? Because it brought him relief. He mourned and he reached the point that he had to confess his sins to God. And when he did, God forgave him. Now he can say, blessed is the man. You see what mourning means now? Mourning, blessed are they who mourn. Those who have the understanding, or rather not just the understanding of sin, but those who have the spirit and the attitude like David. To say, Lord, your hand is heavy on me. I have grieved you. I've sinned against you and you alone. And I need to make this thing right. Blessed are they who mourn. Well, let's look at another one, peace and salvation. Look at Romans chapter 4. Look at Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, notice verse one, number 1. What then shall we say? Romans chapter 4 verse 1. What then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessings, one man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds 
are forgiven. So Paul says, listen, the blessing in seeing in you uh, working human merit, meritoriously to try to, to be in right standing with God. The blessing is by faith in Christ. And he uses Abraham to show that Abraham, a man uh, who walked by faith with God before the law, was imputed righteousness, written on his account, righteous by faith. And David, a man during the law, who had imputed righteousness by faith in God, be during the law. And so he shows, he says, but notice the blessing is a result of those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered, and blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. It is this blessing, when then on, is this blessing, then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also. For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. What a blessing, church. What a blessing. Look at Paul uses what David said in Psalms 32. He says it's by faith in Christ, but just as David confessed his sins, walked by faith in God, he says it was imputed to his account as righteous. So you have blessings. The mourner is comforted by having peace in salvation. And you can read Romans uh, chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. You can read Romans chapter 7 verse 24. Uh, but as a matter of fact, let's look at that. Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. Paul begins to give the conflict of two natures. And you remember he starts to say there's a war going on between my flesh and my inner, my spirit, uh, my carnal man and, and my spiritual man. He, there's this war going on. And, and then he gets to verse 22 and notice he says, For I have joyfully concurred with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a, a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Then Paul, now notice his attitude, church. He says, Oh, wretched man that I am. Now, in order, to understand, in order to have such an attitude about oneself in light of God, you've got to be poor in spirit. And then you've got to mourn, uh, have an attitude of mourning because of sin. Now Paul says, oh wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And now notice the comfort. Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then the, on the one hand I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But with the other with, the, with my flesh the law of sin. Therefore because I've been set free from the wretchedness that's in me. He says therefore.